It's a pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend Philip Jenkins. Uh, most of you know of Philip. Um, I do want to take a few minutes to give you a little bit of a bio. Philip is a distinguished senior fellow here at Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. He, along with Tommy Kidd, co-directs what we call the Program on Historical Studies of Religion. Um, he's also um, at Penn State and has been there for, for, I think, 30 years now. He's the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Humanities at Penn State. He's a historian by training, but Philip's scholarship has gone way beyond history. Uh, it's been embraced by colleagues in sociology and criminology and religious studies. Um, his major current interests include the study of global Christianity, new and emerging religious movements, and 20th century U.S. history, chiefly post-1970. As all of you know, he's published many books, many important books, some of the recent titles, Mystics and Messiahs, Cults and New Religions in American History, The Next Christendom, The New Faces of Christianity, Decades of Nightmares, The End of the 1960s and the Making of 80s America, God's Continent, The Lost History of Christianity, and more recently, Jesus Wars, How Four Patriarchs, Three, que uh, three que Queens, and Two Emperors Decided What Christians Would Believe for the Next 1500 Years. Now, Philip did his PhD at Cambridge University, and many of you know that, but uh, a lot of people don't know that he studied and worked with Leon Radzinowicz uh, for three years, uh, one of the founding pioneers in the field of criminology. Um, in fact, Philip has an enduring interest in crime and deviance um, and the construction of social problems. Um, he he um, is considered a Nash, an international expert on terrorism and he also frequently consults with the State Department. He has no shortage of ideas. He actually wears out my iPhone with emails at all hours of the day and night. Philip requires no sleep. And because he's a historian and he knows dates very well, he is constantly barraging David Jeffrey and Tommy Kidd and myself with ideas for conferences like this one, which he dream up about, dreamt up about three years ago. So yeah, I think we have conferences set up through the year 2022 of anniversaries. He's big on anniversaries. But um, it is really a blessing for us at Baylor um, to have Philip with us. Um, he's been with us now for a couple of years. And it is my pleasure to introduce a dear friend, Philip Jenkins. Yeah, crime, drugs, terrorism, all these things keep you off the streets. It's very, uh, <laughs> very essential. The, uh, the title of my talk, which I will explain uh, in a moment, is uh, Regions Luther Never Knew, Ancient Books in a New World. And uh, what I'm interested in is the choices that go into the making of a Bible. And uh, obviously you think in choices in terms of which translation, which uh, Greek manuscripts, which Hebrew manuscripts, but there's also the more basic question of which books go into a Bible. And uh, you may respond to that, well, obviously the books of the Bible, but uh, the books of the Bible vary around the world. I mean, just to take an extreme example, if you take the uh, ancient uh, Ethiopian church, the Tewahedo church, which has been operating quite successfully since uh, around the year 300, uh, they certainly include a number of books which would be very unfamiliar to a Western uh, audience, including uh, Enoch, uh, Jubilees, the Apocalypse of uh, Ezra, uh, Pseudo Josephus, and, uh, and a number of others. Well, that may seem um, an extreme example. But if you look at the Bibles in front of you, the, uh, the, which uh, would be in the new uh, RSV, you'll actually notice a selection of, uh, of books which would have struck many readers through the centuries, many Protestant English-speaking readers, as a really surprisingly curtailed list of books. And specifically, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, the fact that it does not include the Old Testament Apocrypha, 
would have seemed very strange indeed. You know, where, where, um, where is Tobit? Uh, where is uh, Judith? Where, where, where is wisdom? Where is uh, uh, Ecclesiasticus? Um, and as I say, I'll, I'll talk about how that transition happened and how those books, which were a fundamental part of English-speaking Protestant Christianity for centuries, vanished, effectively. But also how the a very comparable uh, fate almost overcame some well-known New Testament books. Because, as I will explain, uh, Martin Luther especially uh, had a very powerful uh, influence on the making of the, um, the, uh, the, the Bibles that would uh, culminate in the 1611 version. And there were uh, particular New Testament books that he really did not want included. And it's not too difficult to imagine scenarios in which they might have vanished too. But my theme is this. If I look at these books that Luther disliked and actually wanted to purge, those books have had a remarkable modern life around the world. And as the phrase goes, uh, regions Luther uh, never knew. Um, those are among the most popular most influential uh, Bible books. And so I, I, I want to introduce you to a rule. I hesitate to call it Jenkins's law, but uh, it's a principle that I suggest to you, which is this. If Luther hated it, it goes down great in Africa. <laughs> and that's my basic principle. Luther had very strong opinions on almost everything, really. Um, including uh, the books that should be in the Bible. That was partly because he was an excellent uh, scholar, but he also had uh, strong opinions on issues. For instance, uh, the, um, in the Old Testament, there were books that were certainly canonical that he really hated, uh, famously the, uh, the book of Esther, uh, which he found too, uh, too Jewish. He wanted to, quote, kick into the Elba. Um, but Partly as a scholar, uh, he was concerned to segregate those books that were, d did not carry the same warrant of authority. And in his famous Bible of um, 1534, there was a section called the Apocrypha. And in that Apocrypha, you found the, such Old Testament books, as I say, as uh, Wisdom, as Tobit, as, uh, as Judith, and so on. Now, those books were printed in the Bible, but once you've denoted it as the Apocrypha, you're suggesting that it has less authority, and over time that raises the possibility that books will be removed or purged or put into an inferior category. And that's very much what happens in the English-speaking world. If you look, for instance, at the uh, Geneva Bible, uh, from 1560, um, there is a section called the Apocrypha and with, with the, the Old Testament books. So they're there, they're read, they're popular, but they're still in that marginal category. And famously, the King James Version, the 1611, follows that same uh, principle. And it, it uh, can come as a surprise just how important those apocryphal books were for centuries in the English-speaking uh, world. You know, when uh, Will Shakespeare had three children in the 1580s, what were the children called? Well, the boy obviously was Hamnet, um, and the girls were uh, Judith and Susanna, a couple of good apocryphal uh, names. Um, through the uh, 17th, 18th, and early 19th century, uh, English-speaking Protestants were very familiar with um, apocryphal books. Uh, th they knew generally to be very careful to use them for improvement of manners, for learning, as improving literature, although not to establish doctrine, which is a point I'll come back to in a moment. You know, in uh, 1746, when you had the, uh, the Jacobite Rising, um, when Handel wanted to uh, celebrate this, what could he do uh, but write the oratorio Judas Maccabeus uh, about the, uh, the, the defeat of the pagan and the, uh, the, the, the great uh, warrior for God. 
And that continues until the uh, early 19th century, and it's in the early 19th century that the Apocrypha starts becoming, first of all, optional and increasingly uh, disliked. And you know, I, I follow on from David Babington's excellent uh, presentation of yesterday in looking at the role of the British and Foreign Bible Society, which in um, 1826 made an extremely important uh, decision, which is that they would no longer pay for printing the Apocrypha. And that is the point at which the Apocrypha drops out of most Protestant Bibles in the English as opposed to American world. And that decision basically remained in place until the 1960s. What that meant was that the Bibles that the English, the British, spread around the world lacked the Apocrypha, the Old Testament Apocrypha, and uh, that meant that uh, it seems quite natural to us to imagine Bibles that lack such actually very important uh, books. And that, that may sound like an odd comment, um, but uh, you know, some of the stories are great stories, but also it has a lot of uh, theological weight. Uh, if, for example, you have Bibles that do not include wisdom, that do not include Sirach, uh, then it's very, very hard to understand the origins of Christology. And uh, it also, of course, introduces the idea of um, uh, God's 400-year silence between Malachi and the, um, and, uh, and the New Testament. So um, what I'm suggesting is that the decision to label books as apocrypha in the short term in the 16th century was not terribly damaging, but it created the option later on in a different set of ideological circumstances when it made, made it easy to uh, kick, kick it out. And I mean, today, if we use the word apocryphal, the word almost means untrue. Oh, that's, that's apocryphal. Um, and so apocryphal came to mean uh, came to mean disposable. Well, here's an interesting uh, thought. Uh, that fate almost overcame some New Testament books. And the reason this is um, so um, important, and uh, specifically the, uh, the four that uh, Luther wanted to see marked as um, in a second category, were uh, James, Jude, Hebrews and Revelation, all of which he was extremely suspicious uh, of. And in the century between 1534 and about 1630, there was a common tendency, not a majority tendency, but in Northern Europe to print these books at the end of the New Testament, to give them an inferior um, category, and in a few cases, to label them as New Testament Apocrypha. And in fact, there's an influential, there's, uh, in the main royal Swedish Bible, which is the 1618 version, not King James 1611, King Sweden 1618, there is a section called New Testament Apocrypha. And you think, if the Geneva Bible had done that, if the King James had done that, then I wonder would those books have vanished in the same way that the Old Testament Apocrypha did. You know, th there's so much debate in the 16th century over this issue of which books are to survive, and there's a lot of realization that if they are not to be printed as scripture, they may disappear. Um, th there's a famous moment in 1592 when Pope uh, Clement VIII is authorizing a new Bible, and he specifically says, well, you know, you, you, you must include this book and this book. Now, the following books are not canonical. They mustn't be printed as part of the Bible, but they must be printed lest they perish utterly, which is an interesting phrase. If you don't print the prayer of Manasseh, for example, um, then it will be lost forever, and that, that's quite a you know, shrewd um, realization. Well, of course, uh, we live in a, um, a very different Christian world. It's interesting that the, uh, the preface to the 1611 talks about the furthest parts of Christendom. 
Well, those furthest parts of Christendom are a lot less further and a lot uh, larger than they, uh, than they were, and obviously that's transformed the market for, um, for Bibles. Uh, you know, a couple of um, figures which I'll just deal with uh, very, very, uh, very quickly. You know, back in 1900, uh, about 82% of the world's Christians lived in uh, Europe and uh, North America. By 1970, that's down to 57% and uh, has dropped steadily ever since. And there are some regions, of course, where the market for Bibles has grown enormously. The five largest Bible markets in the world are, uh, what is it, uh, Brazil, India, China, uh, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria. Um, a large part of this story, of course, is the growth of uh, Christianity in, uh, in Africa. Uh, in 1900, there were around uh, 10 million Christians in, uh, in Africa. Um, long story short, by 2050, there should be around 1 billion Christians in Africa. And the number of Christians in Africa will go from a little under 2% of the world's Christians to a little over a third. That's a, revol a revolution in a very short time. They will be reading or hearing Bibles and as in any age, particular books have their appeal. And as I'll try to uh, suggest, the books that go down extremely well tend to be the ones that Luther really disliked, the James, Hebrews, Revelation, Jude. And this rather explains my, uh, my, uh, my title, uh, which comes from something with nothing at all to do with the Bible. But there's an English poem from the 1780s by uh, William Cooper which is a bit of uh, what you might call imperial triumphalism. And he imagines the ancient British queen, uh, Bodicea, who is battling the Romans and is about to be slaughtered in battle. And a druid meets her and says, well, you're going to lose, but don't worry. Regent Caesar never knew, thy posterity shall sway. Where his eagles never flew, none invincible as they. And uh, comforted, she returns to the fight. Empire is on us bestowed. Shame and ruin wait for you. So, in other words, the, uh, the, the Roman Empire might be doing well now, but come back in 1800 years and it'll be the British Empire. Well, my agenda is less uh, triumphalistic with uh, no comparable talk of empire, but what I'm saying is regions Luther never knew um, really have taken to the books that he disliked in a very big way. Luther uh, divided the books of the uh, New Testament according to a couple of quite well-known categories. He talked about the homologumena, which is the books that everyone agreed, with, uh, agreed should be there, the Gospel of John, for example. And uh, there are also those that were uh, antilegomena, which meant uh, disputed. Now, the, that category refers to a few books beyond those big four. But he really focused on, um, uh, on these four. Um, so for instance, the, uh, uh, James was one of his bugbears because it contradicted the Pauline teachings which were at the center of his theology. Or as the phrase goes, I think highly of the epistle of James. I regard it as valuable, though it was rejected in early days. It does not expound human doctrines, but lays much emphasis on God's law. Yet, to give my own opinion, uh, without prejudice to that of anyone else, I do not hold it to be of apostolic authorship for the following reason. Uh, firstly, because in direct opposition to St. Paul and all the rest of the Bible, it ascribes justification to works, declared that Abraham was justified by his works when he offered up his son. This defect proves that the epistle is not of apostolic provenance. Secondly, because in the whole length of its teaching, not once does it give Christians any instruction any, or a reminder of the passion, resurrection, or spirit of Christ. The epistle of James only drives you to the law and its works. So what he thought was um, maybe some good and pious man heard a sermon by James, wrote it down as best he understood, not very bright, made some mistakes, and therefore um, maybe it's uh, sermon notes gone bad, he actually suggests. Um, but, but James was absolutely at the center of the, uh, the books that he wanted to uh, remove. He also focused on, um, on Revelation, um, partly in, in large measure because in his day, Revelation was driving insurrections and risings 
across Northern Europe. Uh, there were many revolutionary fanatics, millenarians who found here a textbook for revolution called to overthrow uh, worldly, uh, worldly powers. And he said many things uh, about it. I missed more than one thing in this book, make me consider it uh, to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. Um, the apostles don't deal with visions, but prophesy in clear and plain words, as do Peter and Paul, Christ in the gospel. It befits the apostolic office to speak clearly of Christ and his deeds without images and visions. Moreover, there's no prophet in the Old Testament who deals so exclusively with visions and images. And I, I, I love this phrase. Luther was always down on private judgments, but he carries on. My, my spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. I don't like it, so it's out. For me, this is reason enough not to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known, and uh, therefore I stick to the books that present Christ to me uh, clearly and, um, and purely. Um, Luther was always approaching these books in a, in a scholarly way, and famously he wrote about uh, Hebrews, and he came up with a brilliant suggestion which was, well, first of all, this is not apostolic authorship, uh, this is not by Paul, probably by Apollos, which, if you think of what we know about Apollos from the book of Acts, is a pretty good suggestion. Maybe it's right, we don't know. And uh, the, finally, he, uh, he disliked Jude, partly because it was unnecessary, because there was nothing there that wasn't really in uh, 2 Peter. But the other agenda is Jude is a very strange book in terms of uh, what it quotes, because in the space of a very short book, uh, it manages to quote probably two non-canonical books as if they're canonical. Uh, it quotes Enoch, uh, and it probably quotes the Assumption of Moses. So there's, there's a lot wrong with, uh, uh, with Jude. Well, what Luther did, as I say, was he printed those four books at the end of his New Testament, not with a separate label, not New Testament Apocrypha. That crept in later towards the end of the century. And that, that uh, tradition continues in Lutheran Bibles right up to modern times, uh, German Lutheran versions. I've suggested that these books have all had major comebacks in our time. And that is partly because of the nature of the, uh, the Christianity that is so influential around the world. As I say, you think of those Christians in Africa, 10 million in 1900, probably a billion by, uh, by 2050. And you look at the issues that they live in. First of all, today, if you look at African Christianity, call it half a billion strong, uh, it is a Christianity of poverty. I, I will adapt a phrase which is a very nice phrase that's used about um, early modern societies. What are their characteristics? Um, uh, what are they? Uh, scarcity, servitude, stagnation, superstition, sharp stratification. That list should not be delivered by anyone with a lisp. But also one other feature, if you think that most of those Christians are first or second generation Christians, and think of the difference that means in the nature of their Christianity. It means, for example, that these are people who often come with a lot of baggage from other faiths that are still trying to define their relationship to those faiths, whether you're talking about African primal religions, whether you're talking about one of the uh, great religions of, uh, of uh, India or, uh, uh, or South or Southeast uh, Asia, they have to live often in a society with a, um, a large pagan, non-Christian minority or majority, and where you have to make up the rules of your conduct and your attitude to that society on a daily basis. In other words, these are people who live in an intellectual and a social and a religious setting that is very much like that of the world that produces Hebrews and James. And so much of what has become irrelevant to a modern Western audience in those books is what makes these books so uh, precious and valuable uh, in an African context. 
Now, for example, uh, we, look at, uh, we look at Hebrews. Hebrews has had a, a mixed reception in uh, modern times. Uh, it, it, there are many uh, phrases in it which have entered the language, you know, the, uh, the cloud of witnesses, faith, the evidence of uh, things not seen, and so on. But so much of the book is based on the Jewish temple ritual, and therefore, to a Western audience, it seems archaeological. This is of great historical interest for anyone trying to understand uh, early Christianity, the attitude of early Christianity to Judaism. But that does not affect us. If you live in Africa, if you live in a society based on sacrifice, where sacrifice occurs everywhere, then the question of how your new religion of the sacrifice of Christ relates to those daily sacrifices is absolutely critical and pressing. And where else in the New Testament do you get this? You get it in Hebrews. One of the great modern uh, theologians of West Africa is uh, uh, Kwame Bediako, who passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, he wrote a uh, fine commentary on the epistles. But he singled out Hebrews as, quote, our epistle, that is Africa's epistle. It is, in a sense, the national epistle of Africa because of this issue of sacrifices. And he's very frank. He says that, uh, you know, in, uh, in our society, uh, sacrifices are everywhere. Whenever you start a, um, a, a major event, whenever you have a major rite of passage, it involves the sacrifice of a, um, a lamb or a goat or a, or a chicken. What's the, what are Christians to do with that? In Ghana, for instance, he says that the, years, uh, the year revolves around the Odwira sacrifice. Christ, he explains, quoting Hebrews, is the Odwira that ends all Odwiras. And uh, the, the, again, um, you, you might think that one uh, attitude might be, well, uh, Christians should completely reject these sacrifices. A number of very respectable Christian thinkers, including in the Catholic Church, have suggested that if we believe seriously in enculturation, then maybe Christians need to include some form of sacrifice into their, uh, into their services. Others are appalled by this, but the debates are framed through, uh, through Hebrews. Um, I quote, for instance, a, uh, a Kenyan theologian, Samuel Ngewa. Um, we need to know about our heritage, including the sacrifices in our traditional religions. We must, however, always keep the right perspective. These sacrifices are a contact point for the presentation of the supreme sacrifice, that is, Christ. Another very strong theme running through these is that, uh, or, or, all these books, is that of the relationship of your new faith the first or second generation Christianity that the hearers of these books uh, would practice, and the surrounding faith. When have you crossed the line into syncretism? And obviously, sacrifice is presses, um, makes that issue very central. Uh, but uh, um, an Ethiopian um, scholar talks about the, uh, the crucial importance of Hebrews in informing the lives of Ethiopian Protestants during the vicious years of the communist dictatorship from 1974 to 1991. By the way, um, Ethiopian uh, Protestantism is a, is a very, uh, you know, biblically based, very charismatic uh, concept. In fact, the um, Ethiopian word for Protestant is pente, from Pentecostal. Um, but listen to this. Uh, this is from Tesfaye Kassa, Ethiopian uh, scholar. Hebrews still speaks to all who face the challenges posed by orthodox religious syncretism, African traditional religions, the day-to-day -day temptations of worldly passions, and in Muslim countries, the pressure of extremely difficult situation. The letter to the Hebrews calls on believers to make a bold commitment to Christ in the face of public abuse, imprisonment, and the loss of their uh, property. So th they're looking here, for instance, at uh, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11 with the um, uh, assembly of great uh, heroes and uh, martyrs of the faith. 
Uh, and for, for me, uh, you know, as, as I've explored th this kind of tradition of Bible scholarship over the uh, years, uh, it, it certainly has an impact on the way I read the original Bible text, because I think you, you, in many ways you're seeing the, um, the, the, these New Testament books as they would have been uh, read, uh, read originally. And uh, again, a situation which maybe would not have been totally unfamiliar to, uh, uh, to Luther, um, w w one of the greatest uh, modern uh, African Bible scholars is Tokunbo Adiyemo, and uh, he imagines uh, um, how, how should Christians react when, quote, a resistance movement that is fighting to overthrow an elected government claims to be Christian but mixes witchcraft and magic with the Bible and has a leader who claims to be the Messiah. If you know anything about Germany in the 1520s, oh boy, that sounds familiar. Uh, and what uh, Adiemo said is, well, there's one source for us to know about this. You turn to Jude. You turn to these, uh, these books. Um, if there is a book where Luther's evaluation runs most contrary to current views, it is in James. And I'm going to talk a little bit um, about, uh, uh, about James. Uh, James is a, um, is a short uh, book. Um, it's a very strange book, as uh, Luther noted. It says very little about Jesus, very little um, about uh, Christ. But if there is a practical manual for living as a global South Christian in a poor society, a society marked by problems of syncretism, conflict, tyranny, the extraordinary sharp stratification of wealth, it is James. And so much of what is in James appeals because of its style. It is wisdom literature. Think about it. Think how many of the Christian communities around the world, the new Christian communities in Africa or Asia, come from pre-literate, non-literate cultures. In a pre-literate or non-literate culture, how knowledge is passed on, how behavior is passed on, is through the idea of wisdom. Proverbs represent an appeal to the wisdom of the um, elders, um, a source of knowledge against which there is no appeal. Think about it. We live in a society where we esteem innovation, creativity. If you talk to somebody who's constantly citing old proverbs, you get the idea they're not very bright. Who is the leading coiner of proverbs in modern popular culture? Is it not Forrest Gump? In a traditional society, wisdom is wisdom. And when people turn to something like James, which is the only wisdom book in the New Testament, they recognize an old friend and, uh, with its aphorisms, with its epigrams, with, uh, with its sim uh, similes. There's a West African theologian called Mercy Oduyoye who tells a great story about growing up in a Christian uh, girls' boarding school. And uh, every day the girls were supposed to quote a piece of scripture. And uh, what she said was uh, what they would normally do is they'd take one of their proverbs in Akan, which is the language of uh, Ghana, um, put it in King James English and see if they could get away with it. And she figured they had an 80% success rate. Proverbs are proverbs. And it, 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 it's kind of interesting, if, if you look at the Africa Bible commentary, the commentary on uh, James is by the scholar Solomon Andrea. And as he reads this, he can't resist responding to a proverb with a proverb. And uh, so he says, well, uh, quoting uh, James, the rich are easily noticed and gain the respect of leaders. Then the poor find himself shoved to one side. As, as our old proverb says, thin cows are not licked by their friends. <laughs> proverbs speak to proverbs. That's not a proverb I tend to use on a regular basis. But so much of what you find in James represents the issues that Christians find on a daily basis. For example, 
Um, you, you have the famous uh, denunciation of the rich in uh, uh, chapter 5 of James. And uh, that can be used as being a, um, a, a revolutionary warrant, uh, re warrant for revolutionary action. You know, go now, you rich, weep and howl for the things that will uh, fall upon you. It's also written, presumably in the first century and very active in the, uh, the 21st, for a very poor community who see all around them the symbols of wealth, uh, whether it's uh, jewels and robes and silk in the first century, uh, or everything you see on the, um, on the TV and in advertising in a, uh, in a modern global South nation. And it's instruction, don't pay attention to this, that's going to be swept away. Uh, James also provides the best biblical warrant, the best New Testament warrant, for healing practice. Now, obviously, healing goes throughout the, uh, the New Testament and uh, the Gospels and um, Acts, but in James you have very specific instructions about what to do. You call the church, you anoint uh, with oil. And in all the healing churches, which have been so central to Christian growth across um, Africa, if you look for the biblical warrant of what they do, James 5 is going to be up there. Um, if you uh, look, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the Masama Disco uh, Christo Church in, uh, in West Africa, it's always, uh, you know, James 5, uh, 14, 15. Many years ago, um, Harold Turner wrote a very impressive book about preaching in Africa. And he said that if you wanted to find the most preached on text, well, things have changed since then, but it's kind of interesting, the most preached on text in the independent churches, um, it was uh, James 4.14. James 4.14 basically says, you say that uh, tomorrow you'll do this business, you'll go to this uh, city, you fool. You can't say that. Your life is a vapor. Your life is a mist. It rises and fades away. What you should say is, if it is God's will, I will do that. In a Western society where we all believe that we're going to be partying like it's 2099, we don't believe our life is a vapor, our life is a mist. If you are in a church in, for example, Central Africa, where the average age of the congregation is 22 and the pastor is a gray beard of 28, and the many people will be dead by the time they're 36, your life is a mist, your life is a vapor. These are, these are words of, what was that word again? Oh yeah, wisdom. Um, in, the, uh, in the Sudan, um, for example, uh, you find a, um, a hymn which adapts James uh, as follows. You are here today, but tomorrow you'll be here no more. Our only hope is Jesus Christ, so receive him now. You probably noticed, by the way, I'm, I'm using a lot of African Bible commentaries. If you want absolutely the best way of seeing how churches think, then you don't use any of these. You use hymns. You know, Pro Protestants have got this delusion that they're people of the Bible. Of course they're not. They're people of the Bible and hymn book, one word. You know, if you, if you want to see what people believe, look at what they sing. Um, we currently live in probably the greatest ever age of Christian hymn writing. Um, in terms of the uh, sheer volume of and uh, quality of what is uh, being produced. And if you look at uh, so much of this, uh, so much of it uh, is in concepts which would be absolutely familiar to Hebrews, to, Revel uh, to Revelation, concepts of blood, sacrifice. Imagine, by the way, doing evan uh, evangelism in a society where you can assume that everyone knows blood is the price that is paid for sin, and you just have to explain, oh, and Jesus is that blood. As opposed to in a Western society where now, you see, we believe in blood and sacrifice. No, it's not a vampire thing. It's a, it's a different kind of world. Imagine living in a world, moreover, where Christianity cannot be assumed, and even a vague Christian background cannot be assumed, and where you are talking to people of radically different religious uh, backgrounds. I offer you a challenge. Um, if you had to choose a passage, a verse even, from the Bible that presented Christianity to other faiths who knew nothing of it, what would you choose? And there are a number of candidates, you know, there's the Sermon on the Mount, or you might choose something mystical from John, but my personal candidates would mainly be from James. 
And they, they, I base this on practical experience of seeing who talks to who. James reads, okay, James reads Muslim. And I mean that in the sense of, uh, it, it calls God compassionate and merciful. Um, James says that you should always say you're going to do something if, good, uh, if God wills, which is, of course, the practice of uh, Muslims uh, uh, around the world. Our plane will be taking off and we'll fly to 30,000 feet if God wills. Alarming. Quite apart from Islam, James is remarkably open to other readings. And I, I just want to talk about one particular passage which might be one of the toughest in the New Testament to translate, which is James 3.6. And what James 3.6 says, and let me just see if I can find the, the KJV uh, here. Oh dear, I'm not used to doing things with notes, bear with me. Scooby-Doo, okay, here we go. Uh, James 3, 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That word, the course of nature, is one of the oddest phrases in the whole New Testament. Um, the, the Greek is uh, trochos uh, tisgeneseos, and the other way of translating it would be something like the wheel of birth, the wheel of nature, the cycle of birth, I'm not prepared to accept the circle of life. <laughs> but there are Asian Christian theologians today who say, like Sergei Raja says very seriously, if we are to look for Eastern, Asian influence in the New Testament, it's here. Trochos tiskeneseios actually does occur elsewhere in contemporary Greek writing, but only in the context of Orphic mysteries that believe in reincarnation. What it's doing in James, Lord knows. <laughs> but so much of James has proved to have a lively appeal to Asian cultures, particularly with a Buddhist basis. It reads like translated uh, sutras. Um, not, not, not least verses like, these conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war in, uh, in you? The famous uh, missionary to Thailand, Kosuke Koyama, did a lovely piece about uh, imagining James coming to Thailand and being used to convert a Buddhist country and saying how much of James is Buddhist. Not long ago, uh, an English publisher produced a series of books called uh, Revelations, uh, which consisted of books of the Bible printed in the King James Version, partly because of its very superior language, partly because you didn't have to pay copyright, introduced by great spiritual figures of our time, such as Bono. And the Epistle of James was introduced by the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama began by saying, I, I know very little of Christianity. I do know a lot about Buddhism. This is wonderful Buddhism. But that one verse, James 4.14, your life is a mist, your life is a vapor, beautifully encapsulates the whole nature of Buddhism. James exists and flourishes in a world where Christians have to navigate their relationship between faiths on a daily basis and always knowing how far they can go without moving into syncretism. And for that, of course, they have the correctives of Hebrews and Jude. Those four books speak together quite well. Let me talk a little of uh, uh, revelation. My spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book because it undoubtedly drove, uh, drove so much violence. It's not difficult to find a great many passages uh, in contemporary African um, writing, especially, which speak of revelation as the book which is best suited to contemporary uh, African conditions. 
not so much in terms of violence and bloodshed that will happen, but oppression that is happening now. Revelation is also a book that is, dare I say, soaked in blood. If you look at New Testament references to blood and sacrifice, together with cognate words such as altar and lamb, by far the bloodiest books are two. They are Hebrews and Revelation. 40% of the references occur in those, um, in those two books. There's a Tanzanian uh, Lutheran leader called Fidon Mwambeki, and again, he makes the claim, Revelation is Africa's book. On every page, in every chapter, you read African concepts. You read of the lamb, the blood, the throne, the idea above all in Revelation 6 that you cannot spill blood without innocent blood crying out from the, uh, from the ground. The dominant symbols, he writes, of the lamb, the throne, the blood, the animals, these are common in African religious uh, symbolism. No one in Africa can expect to get away with shedding innocent blood. At the same time, the lamb as an animal of sacrifice slaughtered for the sins of humanity is a dominant symbol both in Revelation and in uh, African beliefs. I think in Luther's time, many people saw Revelation as a book about future and futures. And of course, it, it's not. It's about a crisis that is here, here and now. The, whenever I try and understand Revelation, not an activity which is recommended, if somebody sits next to you and tries to explain Revelation, do not make eye contact, uh, do not show fear, back away slowly. But if there's a passage which helps me understand this above all, it comes from the uh, Ugandan uh, Christian leader, uh, Kifa Sempangi, who led a group called the Redeemed Church, which was active during the Amin dictatorship of the, uh, of the 1970s. And there was one moment where it looked as if the Amin regime had finally decided to obliterate them entirely. They got the word that troops were uh, on the way. And uh, the redeemed church gathered together, and uh, they said this, they, they read a passage, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. By these words, we were comforted. Excuse me? We are comforted by the imminent appearance of the beast that is going to kill us. And by the way, in this case, Rev Revelation and its um, horrors are not something that are going to happen in the distant future after, uh, after the uh, rapture. They're going to happen probably in about half an hour. By these words, will we comforted? Why were we comforted? Well, the comfort in such nightmarish images may seem slight indeed. Except that now the, uh, the listeners have been reminded uh, of two things. They understand the diabolical nature of the Amin regime, and they also know the end of the story, that the beast will be annihilated. Revelation is a story of judgment. And um, once again, I'm relying on one of these uh, uh, African uh, commentaries. Uh, this is uh, Elias Githuka from Kenya. Uh, talks about uh, persecution and why Revelation is the book of modern Africa. The persecution has continued in modern times in countries like Uganda and Idi Amin, in Chad under President Tombalbaye. It is still continuing in Ethiopia and Eritrea. It flares up sporadically in other countries too. Those who convert from Islam to Christianity often face severe discrimination, sometimes even death. The main aim of persecution, the main aim of persecution, he writes, is not to destroy the individuals who are persecuted, but to eliminate the faith they profess. And if somebody's in that position, and they want a scripture which will teach them perseverance through the judgment, the crisis, to the end, they'll find it in Revelation. You know, uh, in, um, in China, during the nightmares of the uh, Cultural Revolution, Revelation became the favored book of the, uh, of the house churches, uh, of uh, uh, independent churches. And according to K.K. Yeo, 
um, by means of the motifs of visionary transportation to heaven, visions of God's throne room in heaven, angelic mediators of re revelation, symbolic visions of political powers, coming judgment and new creation. Chinese Christians see the final destiny of this despaired world in this transcendent divine purpose. It is the hope portrayed in the book of Revelation that sustained Chinese Christians to endure to the end. So what you have is, as I say, four books written in a particular society of poverty, of oppression, of desperate people trying to define their relationship to a world that was absolutely unsympathetic to them and which could turn to violence at any time. I'm speaking about 90 AD. I'm not speaking about 2011. Yes, I am, of course. People can read those books especially and see the parallels. And that is why those books are so popular today and why, as I say, uh, thank heaven, the uh, translators of the English Bible did not create a New Testament Apocrypha section from which those uh, books might have disappeared. In making all these uh, observations, I'm not arguing that Western churches have an obligation to accept every word of African Bible uh, interpretation, uh, because Ghanaians read Hebrew so lovingly in and intuitively does not, of course, mean the Germans, for instance, um, have to. Different books speak differently to various audiences. In fact, as I, um, I look at this idea of different readings, I turn to Martin Luther himself, for whom I do have the occasional good word. And um, he had to deal with contemporaries who were very much like those of the contemporary global South nations. They were people who were in the early stages, the first and second generations, of a passionate love affair with a scripture they had just discovered. And they believed in every word and everything had to be followed precisely. And here we have a recipe to establish a theocratic kingdom on, uh, on earth presently. Trying to calm his rivals, Luther urged that modern believers should be very careful in how they read scripture, especially how they applied it in their own day. They should, as he said, read cleanly, he said. From the very beginning, the word has come to us in various ways. It is not enough simply to look and see whether this is God's word, whether God has said it. Rather, we must look and see to whom it has been spoken, whether it fits us. This makes all the difference between night and day. The word in scripture, he said, is of two kinds. The first does not pertain or apply to me. The second does. When God spoke to David as a king, he was speaking to a king. If I believed that, uh, that applied to me, I would be mad. You have to read cleanly. For Luther, large sections of the Bible, especially those, uh, the Hebrew law codes, rules of ritual of purity, did not apply literally to Christians who lived under the different arrangements prevailing under Christ. This did not mean that the Old Testament was repealed or obsolete or invalid, but people had to seek in it what was relevant to them. Medieval scholastics had a useful rule. Uh, in Latin, it's quid quid recipitur ad modem recipientis recipitur, and that's David Jeffrey. Uh, cringing as he hears my, my pronunciation, or roughly, what people hear depends on who's doing the hearing. We see and hear things not as they are, but as we are. There is a cynical variation of that which is, if I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have seen it with my own eyes. Looking at changing attitudes to the Bible, we see above all how audiences and readerships change over time. You cannot turn the Christian world upside down as has occurred within our lifetimes, without radically revising the terms on which new believers, soon to be the overwhelming majority of believers, read the scriptures. We can only be grateful to the English translators, the Geneva Bible translators, and above all for their influence, the King James translators, for maintaining the library of faith in its broadest terms for the benefit of generations yet unborn, and although they did not realize it fully, for the people of the furthest parts of Christendom. Thank you. Questions for Philip. OK. 
Okay, time to go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I don't know enough about that particular um, uh, event, but, uh, you, you know, I, 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 I read a book a couple of years ago called The New Faces of Christianity, which is about the way people read the Bible in the, uh, the global south. And uh, what I got most out of that was an appreciation of the overwhelming power of wisdom, which is something that tends to get, you know, uh, un underplayed, I think. And uh, uh, as I say, I pay huge attention to books like uh, Wisdom and, uh, um, and Sirach. Uh, so I, I, um, I, I would guess so. I, I, I can't speak for that particular conference, but uh, that's a crucial pun. Please. Right. Yep, Daniel. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I would say uh, Revelation has a very, um, a, a very special place. Um, in terms of the wisdom literature, yeah, I think uh, Proverbs especially does, but of course most uh, Protestant Christians, if they're using the uh, King James, as a great many people uh, still are, uh, don't have access to wisdom, they don't have access to Sirach. So they, uh, they have Proverbs, they have uh, Ecclesiastes, which is in a, a, a wisdom mode. Um, Daniel, uh, Daniel is interesting. There's a lovely story, uh, I know there, but someone within the Anglican Church who uh, is a recent convert, and he goes along, uh, and he's trying to read his Bible, and he comes across uh, Daniel, and he goes along to his, uh, you know, parish priest in the Anglican tradition, and says, you know, this is amazing stuff, what can I do with it? And the priest says, no, you've got to treat this very carefully, and then says the dumbest thing in the world, these things are just dreams. Never tell an African Christian that these things are just dreams. <laughs> and the man goes off in that case and sets up a new denomination. But Re Revelation is strongly the, uh, strongly the preferred one. But, you know, so many of these books show up in the, uh, the oddest possible ways. You know, I, I, I'm sometimes tempted to <laughs> write a book about competing biblical uh, visions, where during the Rwandan genocide, for example, the genocides, whenever they were preaching, would always refer to the slaughter of the Amalekites and the terrible fate that would befall anyone who failed to kill the Amalekites. Look what happened to Saul. Meanwhile, the people who were being slaughtered got together and read Esther because they thought they would be saved like the true Jews of old. And so Esther ran into 2 Samuel and 2 Samuel 1, I'm afraid. But uh, yeah, uh, so as, as I say, Dan, Daniel has a certain um, currency, but the one you come across uh, again and again is, uh, is Revelation, including in the uh, oddest possible uh, context. Uh, I, I quote one example. Uh, in the Nigerian Anglican church, I was just looking over kind of a church bulletin and they have this great line. Um, the biennial meeting of the standing committee of the Church of Nigeria kicks off, nice English phrase, kicks off Tuesday this week with the theme, I know your works, Revelation 2 and 3. <laughs> <laughs> Be alert. Yes. Hey. Biblical imagery, what biblical 
uh, imagery and what, what biblical books uh, are being used to celebrate that triumphalism. Mm. You know, um, th there is such a huge uh, range of of different churches, you know, you find it in uh, in so many uh, different ways. Um, one of the interesting uh, things you find um, is how poor in books, including access to Bibles, even clergy are. So uh, an amazingly small number of them have got access, for instance, to a study Bible. You know, this would be like a rare, um, a, a, a rare treasure. Um, also, uh, remember, uh, whenever I talk about reading the Bible, uh, in many cases, I'm talking about hearing the Bible, which is interesting because that appeals to a whole different part of the brain and uh, carries, a, um, carries a different uh, weight. I would say there are groups that are um, triumphalist, but if there is a theme I would stress, it is one of concern and fear for long-term prospects. And if you talk to a great many well-educated African Christians, they know what happened to the first great African Christianity. They know that Africa was once the home of Tertullian. And they know that all those great African churches were destroyed. And what you get is not so much a triumphalism as a conspiracy theory. You know, you, you will get people tell you at great length of particular meetings where Muslims gathered at this conference and promised to make Africa into a caliphate by the year 2020 or 2050 or, or whatever. Um, and and that, is a, that is a real concern. So that's not triumphalism. Um, th that's a sense of, um, uh, of uh, um, deep concern. Uh, so I, I don't think you would see um, books in celebrating a triumphalism um, in, um, in, in that way. Um, passages, uh, particular passages which uh, I, I have seen quoted very widely. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've seen a number of people quote uh, uh, John 10.10 10 as, quote, Africa's life verse. And the idea of, uh, you know, I've come that they might have life and have it uh, more abundantly. And the way that is taken is the sense of Christianity has to be a healing religion that heals the individual, the mind, the body, the society, the community, and give life in that way, or it's nothing. So it has to be that kind of holistic uh, vision. But generally speaking, it's, uh, the, 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 the verses you get again and again are the, um, are the healing ones, you know, very strong, uh, you know, Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, uh, tradition, if there is a verse in the Bible about untying or unloosing, then you know it's going to be popular and it's going to be applied to exorcism and or healing. And that, that's where so much of the, you know, the Bible tradition uh, is. And often you get these kind of very somewhat different readings. Um, one of my favorite examples, you know, if you wanted to choose one of the best known Bible passages in, uh, in the world, is the 23rd Psalm you know, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, what's it about? Well, we all know it's, a, uh, it's about funerals, uh, it's about death. In Britain and the Commonwealth, it's used for weddings, don't ask. <laughs> but in Africa and South Asia, yea, though I walk through the valley, everyone knows what it's about. Well, it's two things. Uh, it's a political psalm about being freed from tyranny you say, you're my shepherd. You're not. The Lord is my shepherd. And it's also about overcoming the forces of evil in terms of exorcism and healing. So you have like a same familiar passage used in very different ways. It doesn't really answer your question, but I, I, it's, it, it's a tough one. Gentlemen there. Mm-hmm. Boy, um, I don't have enough of a base of commentaries on that specific issue to, uh, to comment. There, there, there are two great resources, uh, both these kind of mega uh, books. One is called um, Africa Bible Commentary. One, uh, no, one's called The African Bible 
the other's called A uh, African Bible Commentary. And these are both kind of multi-author, multi-edited uh, ones. And Solomon Andrea, for instance, did the, uh, the, the one on uh, James. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you, uh, can't tell you specifically. One thing that I've seen emerge is kind of interesting, which is that when you read James, James is not denying justification uh, by faith, but is trying to say, yes, well, you know, that's okay, and that's fine, and that's in the background. But what I'm trying to tell you is how to live practically in a very diff difficult pagan society. And so that's where the emphasis comes on, um, uh, comes on works. Probably tends to understate the theological difference. But I don't have enough of a, a base of commentaries. I, you know, um, and that's partly I don't know them, but partly I, they aren't there in large numbers. Attempts through the years to produce African journals of theology have been of limited success because usually they don't lack the, uh, the, they don't have the infrastructure and the journals collapse after one or two issues. So. Please. Yes, in the middle. Right. Both You know, um, d don't forget the very strong charismatic and or Pentecostal influence that you get through so many churches and which you see in mainstream churches as well. And there's, there's a classic example of that. There is a, an East African church that is led by a, uh, founded and led by a woman. And there's a, uh, a, a, an interview I quote in my New Faces book where the, uh, somebody is uh, asking her, but you know, doesn't, doesn't the Bible say all these things about uh, you know, women shouldn't lead churches, women should keep silent in churches? You know, don't you believe in the uh, inerrant Bible? And uh, she says, I believe absolutely in the inerrant Bible. I am also open to the promptings of the Spirit. And which does give kind of a sizable let out. Um, but but you, you, you have exactly the same issues that you have with, uh, you know, charismatic Pentecostal uh, Christians in the, um, in the West, which is what is the relationship between the promptings of the Spirit, for instance, in prophecies, in visions, and what is the, um, what is the exact uh, uh, text and uh, what is inerrant. You know, um, Andrew Walls, who is you know, one of the gr greatest scholars of uh, global Christianity, um, makes the point that uh, in the second century, as in the modern day, one of the greatest issues facing Christianity is um, how you resolve things like what is a true prophet, what is a true prophecy, what is an authentic spiritual uh, message. And what he says is, you know, the Mediterranean in 150 AD uh, Africa in 2011. They're dealing with exactly the same issues and often turning to very similar texts. I think there was a question over, please. Hey. Right. You've got to remember, um, in the English-speaking world, you know, where you're dealing with like the British and Foreign Bible Society, they are pretty militant on not including notes. You know, it is the text, and that, by the way, is one, one reason why the, uh, the, the the apocrypha goes, um, because they don't want to confuse people with things that, apart from anything else, look Catholic. You know, you can use two Maccabees to uh, support purgatory. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly kind of un, um, 
unedited uh, version. Um, but of course they're influenced by uh, the people who are bringing them the message, and often in very, very odd ways. I mean, I, there's one example I'm working on uh, presently. One of the biggest uh, independent churches in Africa is what's called the Zion Christian Church in South Africa, uh, the ZCC, which is always being accused of being syncretistic because it practices uh, polygamy, uh, it prohibits uh, pork, uh, it has these sort of strange, very African traditional looking uh, customs. And you think, where on earth are they getting this stuff? And where are they getting this stuff from? appears when you realize that it's Zion Christian Church, named after Zion City, Illinois, which is founded by a person from the, the, the primitive nation of Scotland called John Alexander Dowie, who has formed ideas from his reading of the Old Testament where he believes in polygamy and doesn't believe in pork. And the reason you have these sort of strange people with their primitive African views is because they're following a primitive Scot. Uh, so, in other words, the Bible is being taken to them, but it's being mediated through, you know, somebody in this case with a particular uh, sectarian bent. I mean, there are probably like 8 million ZCC followers these days. Uh, big, very influential, and you, you can't have a government in South Africa without the ZCC. And John Alexander Dowie um, would be awfully surprised at the one place in the world where he has followers. Um, but, no, of course, you know, the, the, the Bible does not, you know, drop from the skies as in that old film, you know, the gods must be crazy and people make up a, um, a religion based on it. Obviously, they hear things in different ways. They synthesize them um, in, um, in, um, in different uh, ways. And then the, the, the whole story then is you have people who are trained in the, quote, mission churches, and then from the 1890s on in Africa, uh, break away. And they form Zionist churches. If you're in South Africa and anyone uses the word Zionist, that's what they mean. Uh, Ethiopian churches, prophetic churches. But people have usually got those mission ideas as the substratum. And then they develop and they, they look very carefully for references to Ethiopia or, you know, Psalm 68, great, and build accordingly. Uh, how about the blue jacket? Yes. <laughs> and then uh, behind him, the, you'll be next, and then David, maybe the last question. Okay. Sir in blue. Okay. Absolutely. Of course, um, you know, these are things I talk about, you know, in great length um, uh, um, elsewhere. Uh, there is no African Christianity any more than there is a European Christianity, um, obviously. However, I use this term global South Christianity in a, uh, with, with, a, with care because whether you're looking at, to take an extreme example, Ugandan Christianity, or even something like Korean Christianity, you're dealing with a different planet in terms of social development, economic development, but they have certain things in common. The Christianity is new. Okay, there are ancient roots, but as a mass religion, it's new. And the new religion tends to behave differently from an old established religion. It's much more likely to have people who are first and second generation converts. Um, that is likely to affect uh, attitudes to uh, uh, scripture. Often, you're dealing with people who are exposed to literacy for the first time. You have neoliterate folk, and that gives ideas about the authority and authenticity of scripture, which is why I believe that although you're dealing with radically different social and economic settings, it is legitimate to draw parallels between even Africa and India, or indeed, Brazil, where you have, where new Protestant Christianity shares so many of these same features. I'm not suggesting there is, you know, a, a global south in this way. It would be almost as stupid as somebody sitting in Thailand and trying to generalize about the non-Buddhist world. 
Okay? But, but there are parallels. And they, they also run to things where you're dealing with Korea, India, Africa, um, about a common experience of living among other religions, a shared experience of martyrdom and the likelihood of martyrdom. So I believe that there are certain common things which make it suitable to, uh, to, to uh, generalize. Ah, boy. Um, I actually see a remarkable number of parallels, whether you're talking about francophone, lusophone, anglophone um, uh, communities, um, although they're coming from uh, different uh, settings, although the original mission churches might be different, Catholic, Anglican, whatever. As the newer sects, the newer independent churches emerge, they actually have like a real lot in common because they're dealing with such fundamentally similar uh, social um, so social settings. So I'm very very sensitive to this idea. You know, and, uh, you might look at Europe and say, what do you know Scots have to do with Sicilians? I mean, they're very different kinds of uh, community. Of course they are. Um, but in this regard, there are points in common. Yes, in the back. Please. You know, well, you know, certainly if, uh, if you look at the, um, I'm, I'm, if you look at the New Testament, you know, there's a famous remark about if you take the, uh, uh, the poor out of the Bible, you don't have uh, much left. Absolutely true. But if you go through the, uh, the New Testament and you take out uh, uh, angels, demons, exorcisms, it's a pretty thin pamphlet. And, you know, the, 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 that's true. My only concern about that is I honestly wonder how far the West really has done away with those ideas. And I would cite a couple of examples where, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of you had this experience after 9-11, um, but it was really disturbing how many intelligent and well-informed people you'd meet who would proceed to explain the meaning of what had just happened in terms of numerology. You know, the number 11. Mystical sense of numbers, mystical sense of, um, of prophecy. It's not that long ago, in the 1980s and 1990s, when there was a ritual abuse panic in this country, which resulted in alleged stories, all untrue, of satanic rings exploiting children in daycares uh, across, the, across the United States. That spread to Canada, England, Netherlands, and other countries supposedly secular. If that wasn't a witch hunt, what was it? Um, because people have this idea that there are evil conspiracies out there and they work for the devil. So I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm not too sure about uh, j just how sweeping a victory the Enlightenment actually had. You know, there are many people out there for whom the Enlightenment is something that happened to other people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, but, but, you know, I, I also draw your attention to one other uh, thing. If you ever go online um, and you look at the church founded by Sunday Adelaide in Kiev, in the Ukraine, which I believe is the largest uh, Christian congregation in Europe, and it is, of course, a a uh, congregation in the Ukraine founded by Nigerians. What else? Uh, which, and it appeals overwhelmingly to Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians. Overwhelmingly, it's a very small uh, black uh, pastor team and white believers. And you look at the statements why those believers are in the church. And you look at statements by people called Natasha and Boris and Olga, and they will all explain how they've been cured of AIDS, cured of cancer, and raised from the dead. 
So I don't know if this uh, divide of whatever you want to call it, faith or credulity, is as broad as we may think. David. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Again, let's uh, thank uh, Philip Jenkins for a great session.